Hi, I'm Todd Gessley with Totally Inspired Media. Greetings to you in Pakistan. We're going to be having some pauses in here so that translation can happen and we can worship together tonight. I'm coming to you live with the Christian Digital Network. Christian Digital Network is a social media broadcaster. We really don't create content, and this is the very first content I've created for the Christian Digital Network. So you in Pakistan are our first audience. I've been fascinated by a restudy of the book of Genesis. Now, Genesis is more than just a book of history. It's a book of prophecy. And that's why the devil has attacked especially the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. You'll find very few biblical scholars who believe in the historicity, in the truth of the book of Genesis. Particularly these first few chapters. Most believe that it's a myth or a saga, or just fairy tales. But I've discovered that there is a spiritual dimension to the book of Genesis, that the devil wants to remain hidden and out of sight. Jesus made the story of the flood a prophetic story in Matthew 24. He's, he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so also. Now notice, he says, so also. When the Bible uses these words, so also, it's speaking of typology. In other words, what happened in the Old Testament is a type of future event. Now we can start right at Genesis 1 through 3 to find not only history, but prophecy. Here we find Adam and Eve trying to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. Here you find symbolized the people who try to cover the nakedness of their sins with their own righteousness. Here we also find the sacrifice of the first lamb to cover the nakedness of man with the skins of an animal. Here we have prefigured the Lamb of God, who, through our nakedness, sin is covered. The story of Cain and Abel represents two groups that we'll have at the end of time. Cain rep represents the wicked. Abel re represents the righteous. Two very different kinds of worshipers. One worships the way that God asks. Abel, the righteous, obeys God and worships him as prescribed. And the wicked, Cain, rises up to slay him. Now doesn't that ring a bell? Really, it's a symbol of the final controversy between good and evil. The whole Bible is all about Will you follow me? Will you worship me? God, the I am, the only true God. Will you worship me as I ask? The story of the fall of the Tower of Babel in Genesis is a symbolic story. It really happened, but it's also symbolic. You can't understand the fall of Babylon in Revelation if you don't understand Babylon's tower. Did you know that Jesus made the story of Sodom and Gomorrah a typological story? In Luke 17, he says, As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. He's saying to us, hint, hint, if you want to understand final destruction of the world, go back and understand what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's no coincidence that the three angels, that three angels appeared to Abraham and Lot, 
before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. If in Genesis you study these messages of those three angels, you'll find that they're in the same exact sequence as the messages of the three angels in Revelation chapter 14. The first angel appeared to Abraham and he proclaims, judgment is coming. Abraham pleads with him, saying, will not the judge of the earth separate the righteous from the wicked? Won't he save the righteous and only destroy the wicked? The first angel of Revelation says, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. The second angel goes to Sodom and he says to Lot and his family, come out, come out of Sodom. The second angel of Revelation says, come out of Babylon, my people. Do not receive the mark of the beast. The third angel goes to Lot in Genesis and he says, Sodom is going to be destroyed by fire and by brimstone. And the third angel's message of Revelation says, whoever receives the mark of the beast will receive fire and brimstone. So here we have a typological relationship in this story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Jesus established it. Right now, I'd like to study specifically the story of Noah and the flood. Before we go to Genesis chapter 6, where this is described, first of all, I want us to go to Matthew chapter 24. In verse 37, it says, But as the days of Noah were, so also shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Now here's the question. What is being described here? Most people, most Christians, will say this is speaking about the second coming of Christ. Surprise! Long behold, it's not speaking just about the second coming of Christ. It's speaking about something else. Now that event is, the second coming of Christ is included, but there's something else that most people miss when they read this story of the flood. Notice Matthew 24, verse 38. Now grab your Bibles, open your Bibles. <clears throat> it says, Matthew 24, 38, For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Now I want you to notice this verse and the next one, because there's an important little word, and that word is the word until, until. Now what does this word until mean? They were marrying, giving in marriage. It's a time word, and it's up to this point, up to. It means up to. Until means up to up to this time. Now there's two points in time. There are two untils used in this verse. Now notice what it says in verse 38. For as it was in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, giving in marriage until, there's that little word, the day that Noah entered the ark. Now question, when is this first point of time? It's when Noah entered the ark. That's the first until. Now notice what it says in verse 39. And did not know, they did not know. Question, who did not know? The people outside the ark, they did not know. Until the flood came and washed them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Did you get that? Just like the people were washed away in the flood, so it will be when Jesus comes back. Now let me ask you 
about the second until. What time is that? The second until is the time that the flood comes. So we have two points in time. We have the first is when Noah entered the ark, and the second point in time is when the flood comes. Are you following me? Now what's in between this period? Between the closing of the door and the coming of the flood? Well, the devil wants to convince us that we can wait and wait and change sides right up until the last minute. But that's wrong. It's not possible because there's two points of time. There's a time when the door, when God shut that door to the ark, his angels went and shut that door. Noah couldn't even shut it. He built it, but he couldn't shut it. And God closed that door. And then there were seven days before the flood came. And that clearly comes out in Matthew 24. Genesis, in Genesis chapter 6, you can see that the Holy Spirit of God is present. Isn't that right? Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, it says, and the, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. And you can see that between these times, God gave a probationary period. Noah he preached for 120 years while he was building that boat. And when did Noah stop preaching? When he went inside and the door closed, right? <clears throat> what did Noah preach? Let me ask you that. Noah proclaimed to them that Jesus is coming soon. Probation is closing. Get on the boat. Get on the boat. We must be getting that message out as well. It's not enough to just be ready. It's not just enough to say, hey, you know, I don't think there's going to be a flood. I don't think Jesus is coming back again. Do you think Noah's message of get on the boat was politically correct? But Noah preached and his message was clear. And it was cutting like all biblical prophets. And Noah was considered to be a deluded fanatic. Nobody listened to him. He was the most unsuccessful evangelist in the history of the world. He only got eight people on that boat, and they were family members. They were the ones that actually built the boat. So, but Noah didn't have an identity crisis. He had no problems with peer pressure. He knew he had a message from God that needed to be out and be proclaimed. Now I want to ask each one of you, do you have a message to proclaim? I think we do. And that is that Jesus is coming back soon, and there is a probationary period, and we must be ready. Now, when God, when God called Noah, the philosophers, the scientists, the historians, all had an explanation. The psychologist said, you know, he's kind of loony. He may have a psychosis. The philosopher said, no, no. Philosophically, his arguments don't even stand. The historian said, there's never been any evidence of rain because all the water came up from the ground as dew up to that point. There had never been a raindrop before the flood. The, theologian, the theolo theologians of the day said, you know, God is a good God. God is love. You heard that before? What, lots of religions say God is love. Buddha is wonderful. Uh, he's not going to destroy anyone. Come on, be real. The scientist said it would be unscientific. It would be a miracle. Miracles don't just happen within the scientific method. Every expert on planet Earth had an explanation. But Noah preached under the power of the Spirit. And when Noah had finished proclaiming his message with the power of God, humanity was divided into two groups. How many groups? Two groups. And something spectacular happened. The Bible said, now read it with me, Genesis chapter 7, verse 16. 
And so those entered, male and female, of all flesh and all animals, went in as God commanded. And the Lord shut him in. Now let me ask you, was there a shut door in Noah's day? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And did the door shut before the destruction came? Yes. Have you ever wondered why God would shut the door on Noah and his family in with all those stinky animals and leave them there for seven days sitting there before God did anything or sent the first raindrop? Why didn't God just lead Noah and his family into the ark, shut the door, and make it rain, boom, boom, and just immediately, immediately rain. The answer is for the simple reason that God was trying to illustrate what's going to happen at the end of time. And secondly, there were things that needed to happen with Noah and his family, and with the world outside. So when was the world lost? This is the question. When was the world lost? When it started raining, or when the door shut? Here's my point. Did the world know that they were lost when the door closed? No, the world didn't know that. Did they continue their, their business as usual? Yes. They were unaware that the door had closed. I mean, some of them saw it, but most of them just went, went on their way. Were they unaware that their probation had ended? And that destruction was on, their way, on its way? By the way, that's what it means when it says they were eating and drinking, building and planting, marrying and giving in marriage, and they were carrying on business as usual, unaware that the period between the closing of the door and when it actually started to rain, that they were completely lost. There's no such thing as being lukewarm or being in the middle. They're, you're either in one group or the other. At this point, we do have two groups. We have the saved inside the ark, and we have those outside the ark that are doomed, the unsaved. Do you think the faith of Noah and his family was tested during those seventh days? Imagine, they're in the, they're in the ark with all those animals. Noah has preached, it's going to rain, and for the first time in history, Water is going to come down from the sky and flood the earth and destroy all those who were on the outside and didn't make it into the ark. One day passes, no rain. Second day passes, no rain. Do you think the people outside, what do you think their attitude was? As each day passed, do you think it was more daring? Do you think it was more violent? Outside, the people were actually getting more violent. They were, they were, I'm sure that Noah and his family probably thought, hmm, did we make a mistake? Did God forsake us? But on day eight, as the people outside started their day as usual, mocking those, hey, Noah, where's the rain? Boom, rain, thunder. How do you think those people felt then? They said, it's not historic, it's not scientific, it makes no sense. And frantically, they began pounding on that door. Let us in, let us in. Let us in. But Noah, he couldn't even let them in. Not even if he wanted to. Because he couldn't even close the door. Only the Lord let them in, and the Lord sealed that door. So, they had a time of trouble. There was a time of trouble for the people outside between the closing of the door and when destruction actually happened. Now the question is, is the same thing going to happen before Jesus comes? Is the door of probation and mercy going to close at a certain point? Is there going to be a time of trouble like there never has been seen in the history of the world? Will the faith of God's people be tested? Absolutely. Will the wicked gather around to save and unsuccessfully try to destroy them? I love that word, unsuccessfully. If it happened once, and if Genesis is prophetic, and if Christ's statement 
about as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of, the, of, the, of, the, of Christ, at the second coming, is true, we ought to be preparing, not only for Christ's second coming, but we need to be preparing for the event that comes before he gets here. So Noah, remember, he was shut in, and the rejectors of God's mercy were shut out. That's even before the first raindrop fell. We have two groups, those who did as God asked, and those who chose to ignore the message of worship me, follow me, do what I ask you to do. So was there a ceiling? Notice what, what happened. God actually sealed that door. He put them inside. And so, yes, does the Bible, does Revelation talk about a ceiling? Absolutely. Check it out in Revelation. Do you want to have the seal of God? Or do you want to have this, the mark of the beast? And what is that seal? Well, we're told that seal happens to be the Sabbath. Worshiping God on the day that he asked us to. The seventh day. Remember the seventh day. But as Noah was shut into that ark, so the righteous are shielded by divine power at the time of the end. We don't have to worry about being hurt or injured because God will successfully protect us like he did Noah in the ark. And that is so cool. So many people say, oh, the time of trouble is going to be scary. It's not if you're on inside the ark. It's not if you have the seal of God, you'll be protected. You don't have to worry about all of that. So you know what the devil has done? In addition to the evolution theory, he's invented the rapture theory. He said, you know, people who believe in the rap, you know, people who believe in the rapture theory, they use Matthew 24, the very pasture, pa this very passage to teach the rapture. Look at verse 40. Matthew 24, verse 40. It says, two men will be in the field. One will be taken, and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding at a handmill. One will be taken, the other will be left. And they say, the folks that teach the rapture, they say that the one that's taken will be taken in the rapture. And the one that's left will be the one that's left behind. Well, you know, folks, that's really interesting because biblically, if you look up the word taken and left, you'll discover that the one that was taken away is taken away by the floodwaters and destroyed. While the one that is left is the one that is left alive. They have it backwards. And this is just the opposite of what is taught about the rapture. The devil knows there's a tremendous time of trouble coming to this world. And he wants to convince people that they aren't going to be here for it. They're just going to die and get raptured or just, just rap, they'll just disappear before it really gets bad. So that they won't develop the necessary faith to withstand the coming storm. The devil wants people to think they're going to be in heaven to be raptured when the tribulation comes. So that when it comes, we will be caught unawares. Question. If everyone, when they die, goes right to heaven, celebrating maybe with 70 virgins, you know, if that's what you believe, why is there a resurrection when Christ returns? If you're already in heaven, how am I going to, why, why go through a resurrection and pop you out of the graves? Right? Why, why would you do that? The Bible is clear. That in a, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the graves will open up and we'll, our, we'll get our new bodies. Death, is, we're told in the Bible, is like sleep. When we die, we don't go right to heaven. We don't go to purgatory. We rest from dust to dust until our Creator comes and recreates us at His second coming. Death is like sleep, and you can't have it both ways when Christ returns. Now I know people, I've had people say to me, it's only important that you accept Christ. That's the popular thing this day. Just believe and accept Jesus Christ and you and your house will be saved. 
But if that's as simple as the gospel is, why didn't God save himself the effort of giving us 66 books? Why didn't he just give us one verse? You know, that entire 66 books, if you look at it, it's a struggle of human beings trying to worship God. Some succeed, some don't. Some follow God, some don't. They have a, but it's about a relationship and developing a relationship with God. And God asks different human beings to do different things. He has prophets that warn us and tell us and show us. We have to study that so we're aware of what that's all about. Let me tell you, folks. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and being saved involves a lot of things. It involves more than just an intellectual assent. It's more than just a belief in the, in the brain, in the head. It involves a commitment to a life, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Incidentally, we are also to invest in what we have into God's cause. The cause of building an ark. The church. The church is God's ark now, in, and that's a safety here on earth. So let me ask you, how much did Noah invest in building the ark? Yes, he invested 120 years of his life. He invested all of his savings. And you know, everything he invested in the ark, how much of that survived the flood? All of it, including his family, which is the most important thing, his relationships, his immediate relationships survived the flood. Everything that Noah invested in survived. So if you're putting your money in other things than outside the church, outside your family, if you're not taking care of your family, all that other stuff, houses, cars, um, degrees, all those kind of things, those are tools to help you do what you need to do. But they'll all be burned up when Jesus comes back. And when you die, you can't take those other things, things with you. But what you can take is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's a trouble that a lot, you know, the trouble with a lot of Christians is that they're always saving for a rainy day. <laughs> Get that? A rainy day? Isn't that what the people before the flood were doing? They were saving for a rainy day? And when the rain came, how much good did it do them? Nothing. They drowned in the rain. But Noah invested his resources in the ark. And we should, again, before the coming of the Lord, place what we have on the altar of sacrifice. Noah also watched and he acted. It wasn't enough for him to simply know that there was a flood coming. It, it's, as, as Christians, it's not enough for us to just know that we have, that, w that Jesus is coming back again. If we know it, we have to do something about it. And whether or not people respond to that message, now, you know, not a lot of people listen to Noah. And not a lot of people may listen to us. But it's our job to preach. For as long as God has given us breath to preach, Jesus is coming back. Be ready. We must act on what we know and guide others, like Noah did, into the safety of the church. This is a marvelous story of the flood. It's a typological story, and it must show us what is really coming and what is going to be happening very soon. We must be willing to tell others, judgment is happening now. Probation is closing. Destruction is coming. Want to be protected? Come inside the church. Really, that's what's going on. Too many times, the devil gets us thinking, serving God is no fun. Folks, the gospel is good news. We have nothing to fear during the upcoming time of trouble if we daily build a rock-solid faith and preach to others the message of God that God has given us each and every day of our lives. 
Jesus, in Mark 13, 35, and 36, compares his coming to that of a thief. If you're sleeping and the thief comes into your house and steals your microwave, your camera, your cell phone, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now let me ask you, when did you find out that that thief came? The next morning? If you were sleeping, it would probably be the next morning. Now is there a period of time between when you wake up and when you find out that the thief took your things? Yes. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Christ cannot steal your salvation. Only you can choose your salvation and invest your time and effort and work in building up the church, which is the ark. So, as you are growing your new congregation there in Pakistan, let me encourage you, each one of you, to work together and preach the gospel. Jesus is coming back. But it's not just coming back right there. You need to be ready for him to come back. You need to be obedient and invest and work together to protect each other. Because a storm is coming. And that door probation is going to close. And you will have doubts. But if you stay where you are, you will be protected and safe. Let's commit ourselves, our resources, our hobbies, our interests, and our talents to the Lord today so that when Jesus closes the door, we'll be in the ark. We'll be in the safety of a church, in a fellowship that's reaching out to people, even though it's unpopular to preach. Hey, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. And that is what I'd like to share with you today. Be ready. There's two groups. Please receive the seal of God through your actions, your intellect, and preaching the gospel. And it's so neat to, maybe this is the first time each one of you have looked at Genesis as a prophetic book, but it goes all the way. From Genesis is about worship. Revelation is about worship. And the Sabbath is a sign between God and man. It's His covenant between us. You can't work your way to heaven. But if you understand who your God is, if you understand your wife likes roses, or maybe she likes lilies, why are you going to give God anything other than what He wants? If He wants a sacrificial lamb which points forward to the Messiah dying on the cross, why are you going to go put fruit on your altar? Let's just bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being our God and for warning us with that little word, until, and showing us that there's two points in time, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when you return. Amen. God bless you, and I hope that you're there on that wonderful day when we see that new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, when every eye will see him, that is the day I'm looking forward to. God bless.